File 36 of A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by George Yeager. Book 1, Part 4, Section 4 of the Modern Philosophy. But here it may be objected that the imagination, according to my own confession, being the ultimate judge of all systems of philosophy, I am unjust in blaming the ancient philosophers for making use of that faculty and allowing themselves to be entirely guided by it in their reasonings. In order to justify myself, I must distinguish in the imagination betwixt the principles which are permanent irresistible and universal, such as the customary transition from causes to effects, and from effects to causes, and the principles which are changeable, weak, and irregular, such as those I have just now taken notice of. The former are the foundation of all our thoughts and actions so that upon their removal, human nature must immediately perish and go to ruin. The latter are neither unavoidable to mankind, nor necessary, or so much as useful in the conduct of life, but on the contrary, are observed only to take place in weak minds, and being opposite to the other principles of custom and reasoning, may easily be subverted by a due contrast and opposition. For this reason, the former are received by philosophy, and the latter rejected. One who concludes somebody to be near him when he hears an articulate voice in the dark, reasons justly and naturally, though that conclusion be derived from nothing but custom which infixes and enlivens the idea of a human creature on account of his usual conjunction with the present impression. But one who is tormented, he knows not why, with the apprehension of specters in the dark, may, perhaps, be said to reason, and to reason naturally too. But then, it must be in the same sense that a malady is said to be natural, as arising from natural causes, though it be contrary to health, the most agreeable and most natural situation of man. The opinions of the ancient philosophers, their fictions of substance and accident, and their reasonings concerning substantial forms and occult qualities, are like the specters in the dark, and are derived from principles which, however common, are neither universal nor unavoidable in human nature. The modern philosophy pretends to be entirely free from this defect, and to arise only from the solid, permanent, and consistent principles of the imagination. Upon what grounds this pretension is founded must now be the subject of our inquiry. Uh, Hume alludes to a bit of um, ancient philosophers maybe not being sufficiently sharp on rejecting prior prior understandings or or you know letting their psychology take over and guide guide them uh, you know confirmation bias and whatever right and animating talking about an external world that is sort of animated in, in the sort of four causes of Aristotle or something like that, right? Working from some undescribed principle of how to get these to these kind of conclusions, right? As if they're sort of fundamental extractions from perceptions. So, so it's, it's, there's a balance between what Hume can claim about an external world based on his ex, uh, perception and what kind of principles he can follow to, in order to go there, right? I will, of course, reject any kind of access to an external world, if there is any, right? Um, and, and this is the 
possibly the oldest problem, right? It has been set aside in the last hundred years as if science is going to solve everything, which is a ridiculous idea, right? Um, and now it's sort of coming back because it didn't seem to work, right? They're running into the hard problem of consciousness. So, yeah. The fundamental principle of that philosophy is the opinion concerning colors, sounds, tastes, smells, heat, and cold, which it asserts to be nothing but impressions in the mind derived from the operation of external objects and without any resemblance to the qualities of the objects. Upon examination, I find only one of the reasons commonly produced for this opinion to be satisfactory, that is, that derived from the variations of those impressions, even while the external object, to all appearance, continues the same. These variations depend upon several circumstances, upon the different situations of our health, a man in a malady feels a disagreeable taste in meats which before pleased him the most. Upon the different complexions and constitutions of men, that seems bitter to one which is sweet to another. Upon the difference of their external situation and position, colors reflected from the clouds change according to the distance of the clouds, and according to the angle they make with the eye and luminous body. Fire also communicates the sensation of pleasure at one distance and that of pain at another. Instances of this kind are very numerous and frequent. This is sort of a, so there could be a potential uh, um, sinkhole in the, in the thinking that he has to refute sort of that just because the colors of an object changes depending on the weather and whatever, right? Uh, that means that it might not be the same object or the constancy he's going for isn't uh, valid and so on. No, but I would say that the idea arrives if it arrives from an impression, which, which I would have no reason to think that it doesn't, right? Though an idea might encompass something that could potentially be split up in more ideas. But when I say the sky, right, there are, of course, clouds and so on, right? But, you know, the sky is not just, you know, one blue mess, right? Um, <laughs> blemish. And they thought, okay, so it's a big part of my sort of everyday, right? Everyday conception. And it's all, the, it's all mapped out with some kind of conception, with some kind of cognition, right? There's, there's no area over here where, where, where there's no con cognitions or anything like that. So, so it seems like there's, everything has been dealt with, but that might as well be because the mind just adds whatever it needs to various objects right i mean it's it's part of the whole development of how this works um but when i think there's a difference between if if for instance in a in a situation where you th think of it this way right if you experience an elephant and it's sort of standard elephant on the savannah whatever there it is elephant right now, as soon as you have cognized elephant, that elephant will be very hard to decognize again, right? You can stretch it out and don't do this to your elephant, right? So don't do this at home, please. But you can paint it and, you know, uh, all sorts of shit, right? You could even, you know, you know, take it apart or something like that. And at some point you might say, that's not an elephant, right? Or, or what the hell is that, right? <laughs> but it will, you wouldn't start with something that you just said was a sort of deconstructed elephant if you hadn't had the elephant cognition before that, right? If you came about this 
whatever blemish on the ground that used to be an elephant, sort of, right? You might not identify it as such if you didn't have the whole identification of the original elephant that was sort of taken apart. So there's some kind of staying power for cognitions. When you have cognized something, you tend to stay with that cognition, right? For whatever reason. You can fabulate all, the, all you want about reasons for this, right? They will always be some kind of circular argument, in my opinion. And if I do that, please disregard, right? You cannot get to whether or not you should or shouldn't experience that elephant, right? But at some point, it, it might be so you know, atomized, that elephant, that you can only say, this is where the elephant used to be, right? <laughs> so, but it will take a... It, a bit, uh, it, it will take some effort to remove that cognition from your experience, right? You would ba basically have to remove everything that is any kind of used to be a part of that elephant, right? But if, if you came, up, came around something that wasn't as clearly an elephant as in the first case, and that was when, when I have painted it blue and, and with whatever colors and it fades into some kind of background or so on. You might not cognize that elephant, right? So, and, 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 and that's sort of the sort of point in as soon as you have cognized something, there's a staying power to that cognition. It, it, it won't just go away, right? And there's also, in my in my ca in the case where I'm I referred to in a previous part where I was walking in the woods and you know for a few seconds uh, cognize something as a fox and then it sort of changed you know quote to a beagle or whatever the uh, the name of these kinds of dogs is that sort of similar size and color right uh, that it changes like this it's not like there's a four or five seconds where I don't I, I have no cognitions. It's like, as best as I can think, right? it's immediate, right? as good as immediate. So it's, it's something that is incredibly quick, right? And when it's settled, it's set, unless it changes for, for some reason, right? Whatever reason, which I can't get to, right? It didn't change because the mind all of a sudden you oh no no that's not a uh, fox that's the beagle it's just some autopilot right it's sort of cl wrong classification and then it changes right and you can't even say it's wrong classification but that's also circular right you've got it's just a change it just switches right and that, that might uh, be an indication that it's very very autopilot like right and that could be sort of a, a, a evidence towards that some external thing that impresses itself uh, without your mind having any volition to participate in it other than create those particular qualias that are associated with whatever right is going on out there so yeah well i'm rambling a bit i, I lost my train of thought the conclusion drawn from them is likewise as satisfactory as can possibly be imagined. It is certain that when different impressions of the same sense arise from any object, every one of these impressions has not a resembling quality existent in the object. For as the same object cannot at the same time be endowed with different qualities of the same sense, Mm, maybe I it and as the same quality cannot resemble impressions entirely different, it evidently follows that many of our impressions have no external model or archetype. I want to dig into this one. She says, for as the same object cannot at the same time be endowed with different qualities of the same sense. No, it, it cannot be dark blue and red blue at the same time, right? It, it, it seems like it's usually, I mean, it it's, goes against the whole idea of there's one snapshot quality and that's it, right? 
It might change in the next few milliseconds or whatever to another shade, so be it. But at that point, it is that shade then and so on and so on and so on, right? So it can, but but the point is, as I was getting to in the in in the prior, uh, what I just said just now, right? That it's because you are associating this particular experience or perception with an object, an idea, as you might call it, right? Uh, what I would call a concept, the concept of elephant, for instance, right? And that's why you talk about these uh, and uh, the, these qualia qualities no longer really matters very much because it doesn't change the elephant as such, right? It doesn't matter if your apple is slightly green there or slightly red there. As long as it's the apple, it's an apple, right? And it has the particular, you know, your, your deductive logic um, has a, a certain uh, uh, built, built in uh, understanding from the uh, from from the cognition of it, right? It's the cognition that that is what you want to get to, not whether or not it's slightly blue or slightly green or whatever, right? As long as it's cognized that this particular object that you might want to get to, right? So uh, the 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 changes of, of you know variations of qualities is secondary to the object as such when you have cognized a particular object right it doesn't really matter i mean it might don't get me wrong it matters if your if your you know your cheese is green right i know there's some swiss cheese that are green but i think um alpen alpen cheese <laughs> uh, but you know green in the wrong way right <laughs> So you might, I mean, it might have a, a, a you know, a, a significant effect you don't want, but but that's not what I mean. If you go down to the cheese shop, there are some very light yellow cheese and dark yellow cheese, even brownish cheese and you know, you know, solid cheese and soft cheese and whatever, right? But it's still cheese in in this sense, right? So it's it's the objectification that you're going for, and not particularly whatever qualia, unless they're sort of completely out of the left field and looks weird or something like that, right? But it doesn't mean that you can't identify it as a cheese, right? So. Now from like effects, we presume like causes. Many of the impressions of color, sound, etc., are confessed to be nothing but internal existences and to arise from causes which no ways resemble them. Okay, so this is also interesting. Um, now from like effects, we presume like causes. Speak for yourself. Many of the impressions of color, sound, etc. Are, are confessed to be nothing but internal existences. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, but what do you mean by existence? I mean, existence is something that is X outside, right? It can't be an existence if it's a perception. You can't call a perception an existence because that's that's a different different understanding. It's sort of ah be more precise in your language here, man, right? To arise from causes that, that we have to keep reading. He's he's he's, he's, he's um, getting to uh, the whether or not you have access to an external world here, right? It, it sounds very, 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 very much like it. These impressions are in appearance, nothing different from the other impressions of color, sound, etc. We conclude, therefore, that they are, all of them, derived from a like origin. Yeah, but just because you're used to concluding something doesn't mean that that's the case just from that, right? It's um, be careful here that you're not using some because I'm using used to doing it like this. Therefore, it is like this. That's not a good argument, right? It's not really an argument at all. 
This principle being once admitted, all the other doctrines of that philosophy seem to follow by an easy consequence. For upon the removal of sounds, colors, heat, cold, and other sensible qualities from the rank of continued independent existences, we are reduced merely to what are called primary qualities as the only real ones of which we have any adequate notion. These primary qualities are extension and solidity, with their different mixtures and modifications, figure, motion, gravity, and cohesion. Okay. These are, well, half and half, right? Extension and solidity are not qualities as such. Unless you could say solidity, when you touch something, it has a particular feel, and you press and have an action, then you have sort of, okay, it's solid if you push this rock or this mountain, right? Um, but extension is not a quality. It's not a quality, right? There are sounds and tastes and smells and, 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 and colors and so on, right? These are correlated with a particular sense faculty, like the eye and the ear and so on. But what sense faculty would be responsible for extension? Huh? There is none. I mean, <laughs> space is a part of how the mind works, right? Um, and the sort of the scaffold of the, 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 the perceptual screen. Uh, yeah. The generation, increase, decay, and corruption of animals and vegetables are nothing but changes of figure and motion, as also the operations of all bodies on each other, of fire, of light, water, air, earth, and of all the elements and powers of nature. One figure and motion produces another figure and motion nor does there remain in the material universe any other principle, either active or passive, of which we can form the most distant idea. I believe many objections might be made to this system, but at present I shall confine myself to one, which is, in my opinion, very decisive. I assert that instead of explaining the operations of external objects by its means, we utterly annihilate all these objects and reduce ourselves to the opinions of the most extravagant skepticism concerning them. If colors, sounds, tastes, and smells be merely perceptions, nothing we can conceive is possessed of a real, continued, and independent existence, not even motion, extension, and solidity, which are the primary qualities chiefly insisted on. Okay, so this is problematic argumentation. If color, sounds, taste, smells be merely perceptions, nothing we can conceive is possessed of a real, continued, and independent existence. Bad argumentation, right? Just because you don't want it to be the case, doesn't mean it isn't the, is or isn't the case, right? And just because you cannot point from your perceptions necessarily to an external world with these kinds of objects that these perceptions might be based on, doesn't mean that it isn't there, right? This is not sufficiently skeptical approach, I would say, right? He calls this a very extravagant skepticism. Okay, okay, we will not go overboard in your skepticism, but, you know, I don't see his argument for this external world. I don't see it other than, well, it would be weird if it isn't there, so, so, so this kind of argumentation. I, I don't buy that, right? That's not good argumentation, right? And um, he suffers a bit from from the idea that you have to be able to reason your way to everything. And maybe that's what uh, encouraged uh, Immanuel Kant to write something like Critique of Pure Reason, that there are limits to what you can reason your way to and maybe take some, get to some idea of, okay, what would I do in that case then, right? 
it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get further in your philosophy. You just have to do it by another, uh, in another way than reason your way to it, right? To begin with the examination of motion, it is evident this is a quality altogether inconceivable alone and without a reference to some other object. Yeah, 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 but that doesn't mean, right? Now, don't turn it around. You wouldn't have the idea of motion if there weren't objects, right? So now you're appealing to the idea of motion coming before there are objects, and because that is the case, there needs to be some objects in order to qualify this mo It's It's circular. I'm sorry to say, Hume, but it's circular. The idea of motion necessarily supposes that of a body moving. Now, what is our idea of the moving body, without which motion is incomprehensible? It must resolve itself into the idea of extension or of solidity. And consequently, the reality of motion depends upon that of the... No, that motion is not a reality. That's an interpretation. You have perceptions, and then you have some memory of that perception. You have a new perception that is slightly different. Then when you compare that present, immediate perception with the memory of an older perception, you see the difference, and you create, by that comparison, you create the idea of movement, right? That's not a part of the optics, or any, it's not a part of the perception, right? So, it, this is a very bad argument, right? These other qualities. This opinion, which is universally acknowledged concerning motion, I have proved to be true with regard to extension and have shown that it is impossible to conceive extension, but as composed of parts endowed with color or solidity. The idea of extension is a compound idea, but as it is not compounded of an infinite number of parts or inferior ideas, it must at last resolve itself into such as are perfectly simple and indivisible. These simple and indivisible parts, not being ideas of extension, must be non-entities unless conceived as colored or solid. Color is excluded from any real existence. The reality, therefore, of our idea of extension depends upon the reality of that of solidity, nor can the former be just while the latter is chimerical. Let us then lend our attention to the examination of the idea of solidity. The idea of solidity is that of two objects which being impelled by the utmost force cannot penetrate each other, but still maintain a separate and distinct existence. Solidity, therefore, is perfectly incomprehensible alone and without the conception of some bodies which are... Again, I see this as circular reasoning, right? He's, he's arguing backwards now, right? He's starting with perceptions, and then he starts to talk because of perceptions their bodies. And now that he needs, and, and he gets to various relations like uh, the causation and, and have invented some qualities like extension and so on. And now he says, because I have extensions, there must be bodies, right? Now he's switching it around. This is bad argumentation, right? To the best of my understanding are solid and maintain this separate and distinct existence. Now what idea have we of these bodies? The ideas of colors, sounds, and other secondary qualities are excluded. The idea of motion depends on that of extension, and the idea of extension on that of solidity. Yeah, but motion is then could at could also be seen as an effect of extension, right? Because you have extension in your mind, you get motion because of the changes of the composition 
of your cognitions. So because your cognitions are placed in this space in your mind, you get the idea of motion. Maybe there aren't any motion out there. That's just how the mind represents whatever it wants to present, right? So it's, um, it's, um, it's invalid argumentation, this, in my opinion. It is impossible, therefore, that the idea of solidity can depend on either of them. For that would be to run in a circle and make one idea depend on another, while at the same time the latter depends on the former. Our modern philosophy, therefore, leaves us no just nor satisfactory idea of solidity, nor consequently of matter. Okay, so he's now he's saying that what I'm saying. I have to, I have to make sure I understand. This sometimes he has the devil advocate kind of argumentation fashion, right? Okay, for that would be. Uh, it, uh, let me see. I need to take this. Maybe it's it's actually up here. Okay, the ideas of colors, sounds, and other secondary qualities are excluded. Why are they secondary? Okay, because extension and solidity are primary in objects. So he considers colors and sounds of secondary qualities of objects, but they are perceptions. <laughs> oh, man. The idea of motion depends on that of extension, and the idea of extension of that of solidity. What? You can't have something that is solid. I guess it has to have some. If you charge it, it must be because it has extension. You can't have. Maybe it has a point there, but ah, it's 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 just another perception. It's not an. It's not a different category of perception. It's, it's a different solidity. It's particular sensation, but it's not something you can sort of drag out among the other sensations maybe except vision which is responsible for creating space i would say it's 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 all space and vision work together in the sense that space is already there in your mind and the mind just throws the whatever comes let's say through the eyes and slams it on this three-dimensional scaffold uh, cinema screen, right? Um, so the extension, it is already there. Ju it's just spread out on the extension, so to say. Right? And they said, for that would be run in a circle and make one idea depend... Uh, I have to go. And the idea of extension of that... Absolute, it is impossible, therefore, that the idea of solidity can be depend on either of them for that would be run in a circle and make one idea depend on another, while at the same time the latter depends on the former. So he is aware of the potential circularity of this type of argument. Our modern philosophy therefore leaves us no just nor satisfactory idea of solidity, nor consequently of matter. Okay. Okay, let, let, let's, let's head, head back. This argument will appear entirely conclusive to everyone that comprehends it. But because it may seem abstruse and intricate to the generality of readers, I hope to be excused if I endeavor to render it more obvious by some variation of the expression. In order to form an idea of solidity, we must conceive two bodies pressing on each other without any penetration and it is impossible to arrive at this idea when we confine ourselves to one object, much more without conceiving any. Two non-entities cannot exclude each other from their places, because they never possess any place, nor can be endowed with any quality. Now I ask what I... I think he makes the... If, if two rocks bounce together and you hear a particular sound and you have a particular vision, that is not solidity. That is just two objects that you, you associate with solidity banging together. And when you, these objects that you associate with solidity, 
bang together. They use they do it in a particular fashion that you associate with solidity. You have to use your senses. You have to have the perception of solidity. You have to put your hand or your ass or whatever you want to use uh, on the thing in order to have the sense of that solidity. It's a perception, man, right? Uh, otherwise, I don't understand what he means by solidity, right? Is solidity that is not floating like water or... I don't know, because then water... What is water then? Then water can be a, an object. Yes. Ah, this isn't particularly strong philosophy, in my opinion. idea do we form of these bodies or objects to which we suppose solidity to belong? To say that we conceive them merely as solid is to run on in infinitum. To affirm that we paint them out to ourselves as extended either resolves all into a false idea or returns in a circle. Extension must necessarily be considered either as colored, which is a false idea, or as solid, which brings us back to the first question. We may make the same observation concerning mobility and figure, and upon the whole must conclude that after the exclusion of colors, sounds, heat, and cold from the rank of external existences, there remains nothing which can afford us a just and constituent idea of body. Okay. Okay. So, so now it's actually refuting the direct access to an outside body. Okay. I'm not sure if it's... I'm not completely sure if it's his own argument or he's presenting somebody else's argument. That is sometimes confusing. And that is also why you wouldn't want to state any other's argument than your own when you're doing a treatise. In fact, any kind of philosophy, right? Unless you're obviously doing something like I'm doing here, right? If you're presenting your own philosophy, it has to be your own philosophy. Don't bring in every any other shit, right? Just do your own, right? Stand on your own two feet, right? Add to this that, properly speaking, solidity or impenetrability is nothing but an impossibility of annihilation, as in Part 2, Section 4, has been already observed for which reason it is the more necessary for us to form some distinct idea of that object whose annihilation we suppose impossible. An impossibility of being annihilated cannot exist and can never be conceived to exist by itself, but necessarily requires some object or real existence to which it may belong. I don't see the argument. He's come up with the idea that there must be something beyond his perception that is responsible, right? And then he sort of said, I can't have those kinds of structures or perceptions without this object. But he wouldn't have any idea of an object if he didn't have these perceptions, right? So without the perceptions, no body. And now he's come up with the body, and now he says, that's why there are perceptions. It's circular, man, right? <laughs> now, the oh. difficulty still remains how to form an idea of this object or existence without having recourse to the secondary and sensible qualities. Nor must we omit on this occasion our accustomed method of examining ideas by considering those impressions from which they are derived. The impressions which enter by the sight and hearing, the smell and taste, are affirmed by modern philosophy to be without any resembling objects, and consequently the idea of solidity, which is supposed to be real, can never be derived from any of these senses. There remains, therefore, the feeling as the only sense that can convey the impression which is original to the idea of solidity. And indeed, we naturally imagine that we feel the solidity of bodies and need but touch any object in order to perceive this quality. 
but this method of thinking again it's sort of circular right we are we are we are going for a particular quality because we have the expectation of there being this quality but we only have the expectation of the quality because of prior experiences of the quality right it's it's again this stick to your basis right you can't you can't talk about what is going on in the past are pure memories and then equate them to the direct experience of having whatever right he is mixing up his own uh, he's violating his own ontology or very very close to it right at least um so i i have i don't have uh, i don't his his step his uh, delineation between his ontology and his metaphysics if you want to call it that right um what is beyond your experiences metaphysics and ontology and how these are generally combined i don't know right uh is not very good in my opinion it it's not very good i i don't buy the argument i'm not saying it's not necessarily bad but it's not well argued right it's not well argued king is more popular than philosophical as we look here from the following reflections first it is easy to observe that though bodies are felt by means of their solidity yet the feeling is a quite different thing from the solidity and that they have not the least resemblance to each other okay so he he means cohesion and and steadiness and and keeping itself to it, 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 the the rock stays the rock it's solid because it doesn't suddenly become extruded in one direction or you know it just stays the same shape and so on so therefore it's solid it doesn't mean necessarily touch when you touch the so okay i get that fair enough and and so he means so- solidity not in the feel of it but in the in the uh, in the stability of it well, is that a good term i don't know but that's the best i could come up with a man who has the palsy in one hand has as perfect an idea of impenetrability when he observes that hand to be supported by the table as when he feels the same table with the other hand an object that presses upon any of our members meets with resistance and that resistance by the motion it gives to the nerves and animal spirits conveys a certain sensation to the mind but it does not follow that the sensation motion and resistance are any ways resembling secondly the impressions of touch are simple impressions except when considered with regard to their extension which makes nothing to the present purpose and from this simplicity i infer that they neither represent solidity nor any real object for let us put two cases that is that of a man who presses a stone or any solid body with his hand and that of two stones which press each other it will readily be allowed that these two cases are not in every respect alike but that in the former there is conjoined with the solidity a feeling or sensation of which there is no appearance in the latter in order therefore to make these two cases alike it is necessary to remove some part of the impression which the man feels by his hand or organ of sensation and that being impossible in a simple impression obliges us to remove the whole and proves that this whole impression has no archetype or model in external objects to which we may add that solidity necessarily supposes two bodies along with contiguity and impulse which being a compound object can never be represented by a simple impression not to mention that though solidity continues always invariably the same the impressions of touch change every moment upon us which is a clear proof that the latter are not representations of the former thus there is a direct 
and total opposition betwixt our reason and our senses, or, more properly speaking, betwixt those conclusions we form from cause and effect, and those that persuade us of the continued and independent existence of body. When we reason from cause and effect, we conclude that neither color, sound, taste, nor smell have a continued and independent existence. When we exclude these sensible qualities, there remains nothing in the universe which has such an existence. End of file 36. Mm, okay, so what I'm hearing is that you only have access to your perceptions and senses. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it's it's a little uh, it's a little annoying that it's n he's not clearer about this because it seems to be a very pivotal point in your philosophy whether or not you consider some external world and how you address that right so okay the the next one is the uh, immateriality of the soul and I think I will skip that and jump to the last one which is sort of closing section on on the book one and then we will jump into book two which is about the passions and um, yeah well see you there have a nice day bye bye